Bengal famine is one of the darkest episodes of Indian history when some 3 million people died of starvation and disease within the span of a single year. The magnitude of the tragedy has sometimes drawn comparisons with the contemporaneous Holocaust in Europe, which received much greater global attention. Dismissing such comparisons, the British regime attributed the famine to a range of factors beyond their control, from wartime conditions and Japanese invasion of Burma to natural disasters such as cyclone, flooding, and rice crop disease. To divert attention from their own role in its making, they laid the blame on speculation and hoarding by local businesses and the alleged incompetence of the provincial government in Bengal. But they failed to convince everyone. In 1944, Pandit Nehru called the famine the culmination and fulfillment of British rule in India. In Discovery of India, he wrote that it was no calamity of nature or play of the elements that brought this famine, nor was it caused by actual war operations and enemy blockade. Every, comp every competent observer is agreed that it was man-made famine, which could have been foreseen and avoided. With time, much of the world has come to see this phenomenon. Uh, I'm just uh, going to, apologies. I'm just going. Um, Professor Patnaik, can you put yourself on mute? Uh, and I'll just, go while I'll do the intro. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, sure. With time, much of the world has come to see this enormous tragedy as largely man-made and entirely avoidable. Scholarship has focused on British government's failure to prevent the famine and subsequently its unwillingness to help the millions of famine struck poor peasants until it was too late. Scholars differ, however, on whether this was due to the negligence of wartime government in London or a reflection of the British apathy towards starving Indians. This all changed in 2017 when eminent economist Utsa Patnaik published her research challenging all conventional wisdom. She shook the academic world by arguing that British policy was designed precisely to create the inflation that ultimately killed the millions of poor. And hence, the famine should not be seen as the result of British policy failure, but of the immense success of their policy. But why was such a policy devised that wrought havoc on Bengal? What could be the British motivation behind it? And what was the role of the famous economist John Maynard Keynes in all of this? In today's session, we will dive deep into the economics of the Bengal famine of 1943 with Emeritus Professor Utsa Patnaik of Jawaharlal Nehru University. She has authored several books over the last four decades, the latest among them being A Theory of Imperialism and Capital and Imperialism. Her main, research, her main areas of research interest are the problems of transition from agriculture and peasant predominant societies to an industrial society, both in a historical context and at present in relation to India and questions relating to food security and poverty. Ma'am, welcome to Argumentative Indians. We are really honored to have you with us. Uh, now you can unmute yourself. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Yaju. And you are quite right about the um, incorrect arguments which have been put forward regarding the cause, causes of the Bengal famine. Um, uh, you, you're, you're, you're she... at the same time. Okay, perfect, yeah. Can you see? Yeah, we can see now. I think we, we just need to start the slideshow now. Yes. Um, so, uh, I'm going to be speaking roughly what you because sometimes it's difficult for people to um, follow ma what ma I'm saying. Apologies to interrupt. Your voice seems to be breaking up. Um, yes. Yeah. I don't know what to do about that. Um, what can I do about that? Okay, now it's better. Um, maybe you just turn on the slide, slide show so we can see the full screen. Right now, it's um, a partial screen. So at the top, uh, the, the button on the top left. 
top left. I have put no, the slides. You can't see the slides. No, you just if you click that. Just yeah. Yeah, perfect. Can you see it now? Yeah, perfectly, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. Well, the reason I have uh, uh, because sometimes you know, voice breaks up and you can't hear properly. Um, so you can read what I'm saying, more or less, on the screen. And uh, yet you were quite right in pointing out that identifying the cause of the famine is difficult. A great many arguments have been put forward. Uh, everybody agrees on one point that exceptionally rapid inflation has been for three beyond the reach of all those classes, particularly in agriculture, who were dependent on purchasing food. Any problem? Can you hear me? And, um, uh, we, we, we can hear you, but it's sort of like your voice keeps breaking up. Um, is it possible to switch to like a stronger? Yeah, I don't know what separate. to do about that. Is it possible? I, I'm speaking quite loudly. And no, no, it's so just that the, the network. It's just a network sometimes. Yeah. Gets in. Um, yeah, I think so. I think so. Okay. It's a problem Let, of a, a network. Yeah, let's try again. Okay, perfect. So, yeah. So one common fallacy identified the cause of famine is the fallacy of post hoc ergo propter hoc. That is, after the event, because of the event. Uh, it's a fallacy of wrong causation. So because there was a cyclone uh, in 1943, which destroyed crops, some scholars incorrectly attributed the famine to the reduction in food supply, leading to food price inflation. But the Bengal Orissa coast is regularly battered by cyclones to this day, and the location and scale of the starvation deaths cannot possibly be explained by natural causes affecting a part of the coastal region. In other explanations, the symptom is mistaken for the cause. Speculation and hoarding of food grains is a favorite so-called explanation with some scholars, but Although speculation and hoarding were certainly present, this does not answer the question. Why speculation and hoarding from 1943 and not earlier? Or why did speculation and hoarding cease after a few years? So it's really like uh, saying that a person died because he had a high temperature. You wouldn't think much of a doctor who said that because then even though a high temperature has to be addressed, the question still remains, what is the basic cause of that high temperature? Because that temperature alone cannot lead to uh, death. The real reason for the famine was that the enormous burden of financing operations of allied forces in Eastern India, as they countered the Japanese advance through Burma, was put by Britain entirely on the Indian budget, taking advantage of its complete political control over the Indian people. Every year from 1941 to 46, India was forced to spend a multiple of its total normal budget on Britain's behalf. And the resulting abnormal deficit was meant by printing money. The policy of monetizing this huge deficit by printing money is not accidental. It has been theorized by John Maynard Keynes as the best way of financing the sudden increase in expenditure that any war involved. Before exploring his theory of profit inflation and how it was implemented in India, I'll say a few words about Keynes's four decade long connection with India. That is not really discussed in any book and about which most people either in India or in foreign universities are really unaware. Keynes was born in 1883. The first job that he ever had. Uh, apologies, uh, just so apologies for interrupting you. Can you um, try to turn off your video while the presentation is going? Let's see if that improves the network. If you just try once, maybe the we can still you can still share the screen, but you can turn off your video. So we'll hear you and we can see the. Uh, okay. 
Yeah. Okay. I've stopped. Okay. Yes, this works. Great. So we can still okay. see your slides, and uh, and I think now we'll have a better connection. Yeah. So can you just repeat what you were saying? Sorry, because we couldn't clear that earlier. Just the just the previous line that you said. Uh. Yes. Um. Well, I think if you can read it, I don't have to say everything over again. I was saying that the first job that Keynes ever held at the age of 23 was in the, at the India office in London from where the Secretary of State for India, an important minister operated. And the first book that Keynes ever wrote was Indian Currency and Finance in 1913. And after joining Cambridge University, he gave courses to students on Indian financial matters. He was a member of three commissions on Indian currency and finance, and also for a time of the Indian Fiscal Commission. Now, the important point is that in 1940, he was appointed as an advisor to the British Chancellor of the Exchequer and to the Prime Minister to advise on how to meet the unusual war expenses in UK. And he was also given special charge of Indian monetary policy. Um, Yes, uh, how do I get to the next? Okay, I think I've got to the next slide. I will give you a few quotes from Keynes's own writings. This is not I am attributing anything to Keynes. He was quite openly discussing the necessity of rapid inflation. He says that when there is a need for a big rise in expenditure, it's just like a need for a huge rise in investment in armaments and so on. I quote, the investment thus required was on such a scale that it exceeded the maximum possible amount of voluntary savings, which one could expect. And this is the important part. Thus, forced transferences of purchasing power in some shape or form were a necessary condition of investment in the materials of war on the desired scale, close quote. So the forced transference of purchasing power, how was that to be accomplished? He said the rich were too few. So the needed war resources required cuts in consumption, quote again, aimed at the relatively poor, since it was above all their consumption in view of its aggregate uh, magnitude, which had to be reduced, close quote. So he went on to say there were three ways this could be done. And he was talking not about the colonial context alone. It was a general position he was putting forward, applicable also to Britain at that time. He said that, well, we can either have a reduction in money wages. Secondly, you could put a large tax on wages because you had to actually cut the consumption of the working class. Um, thirdly, you could also uh, ensure that there was a rise in prices of goods without a sufficient rise in money wages so that real earnings fell. This is what he termed a profit inflation, distinguishing it from an income inflation where prices may be rising, but people's incomes are rising at the same rate. So there's no decline in real earnings. The profit inflation was specifically designed to accomplish a fall in the real earnings of the mass of the population. And in Britain, of course, the mass were wage earners. But a profit inflation would be equally effective from Keynes's point of view in a country like India, where wage earners were, did not constitute the mass of the population, but there were you know, self-employed poor people like artisans and fisher folk, poor peasantry and so on, who had to buy food from the market, but they too would suffer a uh, fall in their real earnings if there was a rapid food price rise. So Keynes goes on to say, I conclude therefore to allow prices to rise by permitting a profit inflation in times of war is both inevitable and wise. So he was advocating profit inflation. Now, basically what Keynes was saying here is that, you know, we can't, uh, he went on to say that, look, we can't cut money wages the trade unions would can't actually put a big tax on wages because the trade unions would object to that, but they would not object to a policy which raised prices of goods, 
even though their incomes were not rising as fast. So this later on was called money illusion by Irving Fisher, another economist. But Keynes was wrong. He thought that workers could be tricked by raising but the trade unions in Britain strongly opposed his inflation policy. Uh, sorry, so we, 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 it sorry, was not implemented there. We missed that. So uh, your voice was lost. So wages, he, he was, you said Keynes was wrong. Wages could be raised, I think, and after no, no, that. No, no, no. Keynes was wrong in thinking yeah. that the working class could be tricked. Right. By raising prices faster than wages. Yeah, prices faster than wages. They would yeah. not understand that, uh, yeah, that their real earnings were falling. That yeah, they would not realize the that their context. real earnings are falling. Yes, yes, got it. Yeah. The trade union leaders, like the trade union leaders like Anarin Bevan, Uh, yeah, trade union leaders like uh, Adam Webb strongly opposed his uh, suggested policy of profit inflation because he realized that inflation was a highly regressive policy that would hurt to the greatest extent the poorest wage earners. They said that, look, for workers would voluntarily pay more taxes to fight fascism, but they would not tolerate being tricked into a reduction of their real wages through deliberate inflation. And facing this inflation, Keynes had to abandon his original idea for Britain. And instead he worked out a system of progressive taxation, which was acceptable to the trade unions. But in India, there was no similar political opposition. Why not? After all, our leaders at that time were intellectually very able. But the reason probably was that all the leaders were in jail. And it is doubtful if they had any access to the debate openly going on in Britain. And not only the Congress leaders, most of the communist leaders were also in jail at this time because they were members of the Congress Socialist Party. So it was in India that Keynes's idea of profit inflation was actually put in practice. In order to reduce the consumption of the masses and redistribute incomes towards profits to finance the war. But of course, if you implement this policy, uh, in a country which has only 3% three, 3 of the per capita income of the average citizen of Britain, the results are going to be devastating. It is one thing to implement it in Britain. It would have hurt the workers, but probably they would not have starved. But it's a very different thing in a country like India. Well, it, it would be a vicious thing. The you, the average income was only, sorry? It would have been a vicious policy regardless, even in Britain, to penalize the poor. It would have been, pick. it would have been, it would have been. And, but what I'm saying is that since the income was 30 times higher and in purchasing power parity terms, 10 times higher, the average income, probably it would not have led to mass starvation. It would have led to enormous distress on the part of the workers. But in right. any case, it was not implemented because the trade unionists opposed it. Very rightly so. They were absolutely right opposed to the policy to say, look, we will contribute more taxes. We want to fight fascism, but we will contribute taxes according to our ability. So what Keynes did there was that he worked out a system of progressive taxation in Britain the workers earning less than two and a half pounds a week were exempted completely. And then the workers earning in different at different levels. Okay, so it was progressive. The poorer workers were taxed less, the better off were taxed more. And there's all progression 
that they would be paid back some of their taxation contribution after the war ended. In India, however, there was no such uh, consideration because there was no political opposition, unfortunately. Had there been a strong political opposition, maybe Keynes would not have been able to implement this policy in India. But because all the leaders um, on, on this very point, we have somebody, um, we have we have a comment from one of the attendees, uh, Dr. Madhushri Mukherjee, who is also the yes. author of um, Churchill's Secret War. Uh, she just made a comment that there was an extremely efficient food rationing system in the United Kingdom. No one would have starved. In fact, mortality statistics improved during the war because of the excellent system put into place for taking care of the people. And, and goes without saying, obviously, there was nothing put in place in India. The point is that Keynes was opposed to rationing in Britain. But it was the other leaders, political leaders, who insisted that no war time had to move. Um, Professor, I just wanted to make the point. Professor, but thank your voice is breaking a lot now. I don't know why, but somehow the network has kind of <laughs> giving, given away. Is it possible to try a different network so that you, we can hear you uh, more clearly, hear you more clearly? I think uh, it would be difficult because uh, the other network has been um, okay. in you or a, so it would be even worse probably. But I changed to this network waking up just the connection yeah I didn't get any of that what you said because I mean, your whole voice is kind of like just we only get like a partial of what you say and then the rest gets cut off um let me see if there is an alternate way um okay anyway let's let's continue and then I'll in I'll try and explore if there's a if there's a way to uh, get around this Professor Patnaik? Okay, maybe she's trying to change. She's trying to test something else. Sorry, everyone, just uh, just let's be patient for a couple of minutes. Um, hopefully she can reconnect with a different network. Yeah, I'm sorry, it has not happened before that the connection is so poor. I don't know why that's happening because I'm connected through Geo. The other one, BSNL, in any case, <laughs> is very unstable. <laughs> Okay, uh, let, let's continue. Yeah. I think maybe sometimes, do you come closer? Because sometimes we ha hear you partially and then your voice. Oh, okay. okay. Maybe, uh, I don't know. It's because <laughs> we get sometimes half your sentence and then the other goes. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me better now? You can yes. hear me better. Yes. Okay, let me just speak very near the uh, screen. Okay. Okay, so, uh, yeah. Under an agreement signed between Britain and the colonial government, the bulk of the expenditure for war and for provisioning housing and transporting allied troops had to be met by India against the promise of repayment once the war ended. The Reserve Bank of India's account in London was credited on paper with the sterling equivalent of the rupees India spent. But this account was frozen and not a single penny could be drawn. So this mere paper account of sterling with the RBI was treated as reserves and currency to the extent of two and a half times was printed against these deposits in Britain. Now, India did not have the capacity to print notes at such a frenetic rate and even uh, during the demonetization, we did not have the capacity, as you know, because it took a very long time for the notes to come back into circulations. But the point is that this was a merely a paper reserve, paper entry. No reserves existed in reality, since not a single penny could be drawn. Essentially, this was an accounting, accounting trick on the part of Britain to make Indians pay for the allied spending in South Asia via a forced decline in their consumption. 
And they could do this because they had complete control, political control. So this recoverable war expenditure was the death warrant for 3 million, at least 3 million of the poorest people in Bengal who were wage laborers, poor peasants, artisans, fisher folk, and service providers, all of whom had to buy food from the market. Now this graph gives you an idea and it is from the paper I wrote for in EPW. The basic data are from the Reserve Bank of India's uh, the report, which covers this period. And you can see the phenomenal rise in the total spending, that is the blue line. I hope you can see it in color, which is going up steeply. So this starts happening after Pearl Harbor in December, 1941, when allied troops start pouring into Eastern India. And by the way, when we say Bengal, we are talking really about, uh, even though uh, you know, Orissa had become separate uh, about a decade earlier, we are really talking about the old concept of Bengal presidency, that is Bengal, Bihar, Orissa, Assam. So it is not Bengal, today's Bengal at all, but today's Bangladesh and Assam and West Bengal and Orissa, and to some extent Bihar. So when these troops, Allied forces started pouring into Eastern India, there was of course a war boom because airstrips had to be built, barracks had to be built, factories were built, and there was a huge expansion in all the war related industries. Now, these allied troops had to be fed, they had to be housed, their transportation costs had to be met. And moreover, not only the allied troops, but all the new, uh, workers employed in the expanding factory sector related to war production, their requirements also had to be met through Indian resources. And the way this was done was to double and redouble and again double the total expenditure. Now, th that is the blue line. You can see that it starts exploding after 1941 in particular, just goes up steeply. So between 41, and 42, 41 refers to 40, 41, 42 to 42, uh, 41, 42, and so on. So I've, in brief, uh, I've kept it as one year instead of the confusing, you know, 40, 41, and so on. So you can see it has gone up by about 70% by this time, then, uh, uh, sorry, 70% uh, by 40, 41. Then it has doubled by 41, 42. That amount is again doubled by 42-43. So by 42-43, actually, the, um, there was a sevenfold rise in the total expenditure. And it amounted to already more than one third of the entire pre-war GDP of British India. Now we cannot even begin to imagine what this meant in terms of food price rise, see, because when you have this kind of, and 80% of this expenditure was simply met by printing notes. The notes were printed uh, in England and they were flown over. And, so and this, what was this expenditure on? What was the, Indian, the government of India in Delhi spending all this money on? Uh, well, it was spending basically on the uh, maintenance of allied forces, you know, because as I said, the entire wartime expenditure of the allies in India, and this was a war which had nothing really to do with India. It was a war between the allied powers and the Axis powers. So why should India be made to pay for it? So it was made to pay for it simply because it was under the complete uh, political control of Britain. So this burden of financing the war was unjustly put on the Indian people, okay? So all these things I've been talking about, the building of the factories, the airstrips, the barracks, the financing of the movements of the troops and the air personnel, okay? All this had to be paid for by the people of India, basically. Now, this also meant that there were, through multiplier effects, there was a huge increase in the demand for the basic necessities. 
basic necessities of food, clothing, and so on. On the part of both the Allied forces being in, because the Allied forces were in Eastern India, and because there was an expansion in factory production geared to war, there was a big expansion in the demand. But the supply obviously could not increase because food production, rice production in Bengal, and naturally the requisitioning of food, food grains, was made by the government from the surrounding areas of Calcutta. They did not go all the way to Punjab or to near Bombay to acquire food grains. So what happened was that even though prices rose in the whole of India, if you look at the average rise in India, in Britain, prices rose over the entire war by 70%. In India, the price index rose by 200%. That is, it trebled. But because the actual uh, location of the Allied troops was in Eastern India, and the actual procurement of grain by the government, by the way, the colonial government quickly put in place a system of procurement and rationing in order to ensure that war production would not be hindered. So rations were made available to all those who were engaged, let us say, Port Trust of India, uh, all those who were engaged directly in war production and to the general urban population in uh, Kolkata. So one way or the other, most of the urban population had access to food, but the entire burden of financing this huge expenditure, this abnormal expenditure was passed on to the unprotected mass of the rural population. And the impact was felt all over India, but it was felt to a much greater extent in Eastern India naturally, because most of the procurement was done from this region. So owing to this- And that's because the allied forces were there. So I think a lot of people are not even aware that there was U US uh, and other allied armies were also stationed in Eastern India. And, yes. and, as, and as you mentioned, the procurement policies prioritized them as well as other Indians who were involved in the war, war effort. That's right. Which, whereas the peasants were not at all a priority, saving the peasants were not a priority for the government. No, no, you see, the, the you had to, re according to Keynes, this was, would only be possible through a reduction in real consumption. That was the basic theory. That is the Keynesian theory. And he was, of course, right. The question is, Whose consumption is reduced? All right? Whose consumption is reduced? And as far as the British were concerned, they wanted war production kept going, so they could not afford people engaged in the war in, uh, industries to die, but they did not really care what happened to the population who were not directly engaged in war production, okay? So this is why this, uh, this whole burden of reduction of consumption was passed on to the rural population. And within the rural population, of course, the people who suffered most were the poorest who were dependent on the market for purchasing food. Now, I'll give you a little bit of data which I've not got in the slides about the extent of the food price rise. Yes. Now, let me just find the fix. Sorry, let me just find those figures, because people like Bhavani in Bengal, uh, wrote a book, Rural Bengal in Ruins, and uh, you know others also wrote about this. So you look at the extent of the food price rise. The open market price of rice per mound, a mound was equal to 37 kilograms in Kolkata, was six rupees in January 1942. It rose four times to 24 rupees by April 1943. And over the next six months, it nearly doubled to 40 rupees by October. So from 6 rupees January to 40 rupees by October 1943. So, that sorry. is a 700% rise. Okay, 700% rise. Within, within a span of how rise. long? Was, in how many months was a 700% rise? Less than two years. Less than two years, okay. Less than two years. January 1942 to October 1943. So generally, when we think of famines, we understand famines to be the result of acute shortage of food, 
but there is some i guess uh, amartya sain was one of the one of the people who came out and said there was no real shortage of food even though there was burma had been invaded and uh, all this allied forces were stationed there and they needed to um, they were also uh, a drain on the limited food resources of bengal but he has still argued that there was no shortage of food it was it was a question of entitlement what's your view in that no of course professor amartya sain is perfectly right but he had only one sentence there in his poverty and famines where he said that uh, you know uh, the huge the uh, exceptional rise in expenditure uh is what led to food the high rate inflation in food prices he was completely right in that and what he had in mind by entitlement uh, is that the uh, real earnings of not only wage earners but all those who were petty producers artisans fishermen and so on who had to buy food from the market you know because you can't talk about real wages in their case they were not wage earners but you can talk about real earnings and real entitlements right. that declined radically okay so he was generalizing the idea of real wage decline through his idea of entitlement the only thing is that he did not spell it out so food became unaffordable for a section of the society and they basically starved but um what do you think was a complete food? may i just complete the uh, calculations i have made uh, about the uh, you know when this started starving so uh, uh, 40 rupees per month by october 1943 a seven fold rise for comparison the per capita monthly income in 1940 was 5.3 rupees okay assuming that a person at this average income level spent on nothing else except 300 grams of rice daily nothing else at all not even cooking fuel or anything only 300 grams of rice after cooking somehow he would get some fuel and cook it we can assume this would give him 1100 or her 1100 kilo calories just enough to keep a person alive but not allow that person to really do any work or move around just for maintaining the body now such a person at the average level of income would no longer be able to buy even 300 grams of rice by january 1943 and the bulk of the population was below the average level of income so we can see that what a absolutely uh, you know cruel policy this was which deliberately as it were caused the majority of the poorest people in rural bengal to face first dearth then hunger then famishment and finally death through starvation but the point is that the this deliberate policy of profit inflation was something which was not recognized as a deliberate policy everyone realized that something deliberate was happening but they did not associate keynes with it i have not seen a single piece of writing by anybody who relates what happened to keynes directly even though keynes had some very bright students under him working in cambridge who must have realized what was happening so i would like to come back to this just just Briefly, just one comment to on that the, the sorry, most to the complicity yeah. of indian intellectuals right at the end because this is a very serious matter it is it there was a complicity on the part of people who knew what was happening but did not dare to oppose such an influence influential person as keynes or oppose the in the, uh, the british government and this continues to this day there are elements of complicity in the exploitation of the indian people to this day sorry you were saying something please um i just want to say that there the, the most of the discuss, discourse around this famine had at the time and even till today it focuses on the hoarding and the speculation of for food prices in in the wake of the invasion of burma and everything the the idea is that local businesses had started hoarding and they had they were speculating they could sell it for much higher prices and that is what exacerbated uh it, the moderate shortfall do, do you so they feel like you said that people knew that something was off something was 
going wrong, something was fishy. But wasn't the wasn't the generally the this this the sense that it was the local businessmen who were up to something fishy, who were the ones who were speculating. No, but as I said right at the beginning, this is a fallacious argument because it mistakes a symptom for the cause. Right. Now, you know, hoarders and speculators, it is their dharma. As it were. They're there to hoard and speculate. But they look at real trends. They will hoard and speculate if they expect prices to rise. Okay? The hoarding and speculation is based on expectations of price rise in economics, and that is perfectly uh, actually the case. The hoarders and speculators will not hoard and speculate if they expect prices to fall, because then they will suffer losses. But they will hoard and they will speculate if they expect prices to go on rising. So they are the ones who really tracked uh, British policy because they were the ones who were most involved in uh, gaining from the policy of this kind of deliberate profit inflation. Now, uh, I gave the analogy of a high temperature killing a man not being an adequate explanation, you would really not trust a doctor uh, whose patient dies and he tells you, oh, well, the patient had a very high temperature. Then you would say that, you know, but what caused the temperature, high temperature? Why could you not treat the basic cause? So temperature is just a symptom. It is not the basic cause, okay? So this is the same thing with speculation and hoarding. That was not the basic cause. It so, was so a just, of just the on fact. that, generally, yeah. You're absolutely right. So they were they were speculating because they expected the prices to rise. And generally, the reason given for that is they expected that India could be invaded by the Japanese. And because all these fears were out there, they thought prices would rise. But you are saying they had already sensed that the government was doing inflation. The government was um, in, the government spending was going up so much and there were in, this inflationary forces out there. Which is they why they were sensed, raising prices. They had not sense. They knew because they okay. see it happening. You know, as the graph shows, it's not a question of intuition or sensing. They could see the fact that the expenditures were growing exponentially. And as I said, you know, if you uh, if you can imagine a situation where by the time you get to this point, uh, I don't know whether you can see the graph. You, can you see it on your screen? Yes. We can see it. Mm. What happened to the graph is gone. I'm afraid I've lost that. No, no, you went to the next slide, back. but we've seen the graph for a while. So we've all studied the graph. We yeah, can... yeah. So, you know, they had seen year after year, the government spending like uh, doubling the expenditure until by 1943, uh, uh, the expenditure amounted to already one third of the entire GDP. Whereas the entire government, central government budget had been 8% of the GDP. So if you can imagine the same thing happening uh, in India today, uh, you know, you would get an idea of, uh, you know, how abnormal uh, this situation was. Yeah, supposing you take the year before the pandemic, the year 2019, all right? Take, a, take the 2019 figure. In 2019, India's central government outlay was 15 lakh crore. One lakh crore is 10 raised to the power 12, namely 1 trillion. This sum is 15 trillion. I'm giving you rounded figures so that uh, you don't have, um, uh, you know, I'm not giving you the exact figures. Now, this outlay of uh, 15 trillion was just under 8% of India's GDP, which was 190 trillion in 2019. Supposing over the next three years, by the present fiscal, 22-23, the central government outlay has been raised almost 10 times to 144 trillion. It was amount to three quarters of the 2019 GDP of the whole of India. And it would really amount to, you know, uh, almost 10 times the original outlay three years ago, almost 10 times. Assume that tax revenues have trebled over the period last three years, as in the past, the total deficit in the current fiscal 
would be 100 trillion rupees. That is uh, entirely and entirely met by printing notes. Okay, and that would be uh, roughly about more than half of the entire 2019 GDP of India. So it is unbelievable. It is completely unbelievable. The scale of the deficit financing through printing notes. And as I've written in my paper, in the world was such an irresponsible monetary policy being followed. And Keynes was directly put in charge of Indian monetary policy because he had special expertise in the area of Indian money and finance. And yet, how many years have passed? Some, more than 75 years have passed since the famine. Not a single intellectual has pointed a finger at Keynes and the Keynes' policy of profit inflation. It is cast why, do you, why, why do you think that is the case? Why has there been no um, examination of Keynes' involvement and his policies? Well, obviously, obviously, the British would not do it. Yeah. Because they benefited from this, okay, policy. Um, and let me just talk about the mortality for a moment, then I'll come back to your question. I think the slide here is giving us the mortality. Okay. So, uh, your, your voice is gone again. <laughs> Sorry. No. I have to point it. Out of this. I can't go up and down for some reason. Anyway, let's okay. stay with this. I'll just tell you what the famine mortality in Bengal over these less than two years was six times the entire, and this is civilian mortality, the entire mortality in Britain over the entire war period of civilian plus armed forces. If you take that entire mortality over the entire war period in Britain, it was a little less than half a million. Whereas more than 3 million people, six times that number died in less than two years in Bengal alone. And there, so was, the no, and there was no war also going on here, unlike in, in Europe. Uh, no, I'm, uh, but Indians were fighting. Indians were fighting in the army on behalf of Britain against Japan. They were fighting in Mesopotamia. They were fighting in Europe. So I'm not taking the mortality of Indian soldiers at all. You're not taking only civilian mortality. Only the civilian mortality and only in Bengal. That was yeah. six times the total civilian plus military mortality in Britain, six times over a period of less than two years. So the scale of it is just mind boggling. And what I've not mentioned in my paper, because I had not uh, looked at the age structure of the population at that point, is that it was ours was a very young population because the expectation of life at birth was very low at that time. 37% of the population consisted of children aged 14 years and less. Beyond 14 years, they're not classified as children anymore in the census, okay? These are census data from 1941. Now, even if we assume that parents first fed their children, so the proportion of children in the start population in Bengal was less than 37%, assume one third. Even so, more than a million children died of starvation during the Bengal famine. The of children alone was more than double the total mortality in Britain over the entire war period, which was below half a million. So it is the child mortality which is especially, you know, heart rending. I mean, I've spoken and written about the Bengal famine so often, but just thinking about it would make you weep. So when you, when you describe the magnitude of this disaster, it's just it's beyond not a disaster. All proportions. It is not a disaster. The magnitude of this genocide, the disaster suggests some kind of other causes. Right. So it's, I it's, have it's, called it in my paper, a genocide by economic means to ben benefit Britain and its allies. Okay. Yeah. My question is then, 75 years of independence, why has this not gotten more attention, even in India? When I went through school, I did not learn about this. I found, I discovered this much later. How did so something of this scale, this magnitude, end up becoming a footnote in Indian history? There are two reasons. One is that the British themselves suppressed it. 
suppress the knowledge of the famine. They do not mention it anywhere in their own history books written by their scholars about India. The uh, biographers of Keynes do not mention the extent of the mortality. They discuss the debate which took place at the conference in 1944, where Keynes was the main negotiator from Britain's side and a delegation went from India, including the British finance member, an Indian delegation, which included the future governor of the Reserve Bank of India to request Britain to pay at least a tiny fraction of Britain, what Britain had promised to pay after the war, because the situation was extremely dire. Apart from the famine in Bengal, the per capita food grain availability taking the whole of India had fallen from to 137 kilograms annual by 1946, compared to 209 kilograms at the end of the First World War. It was a huge decline. So the average calorie intake of the population of India as a whole was around 1600. It was barely 500 calories above starvation level. So it was a very bad situation, okay? But the British refused to release any funds that they owed, even though they had promised to repay India after the war. They said, Britain is a war devastated country. The Indian delegation said that, look, our population has suffered so gravely. Three million people are dead. I mean, they didn't have the number then. They said millions of people died in Bengal. So to that Keynes said, the suffering is in the past, which is illogical because if Indian suffering was in the past, so was the British suffering. And you could not say that Britain could not afford. Now, suppression on the part of the uh, colonial power, number one. Number two, the students who were there in Cambridge did not raise their voices except one, there is a very interesting pamphlet which was brought out by uh, the Majlis. I think it's the Cambridge Majlis, I've forgotten now, uh, which is authored by one Jyoti Bose. Now, whether it is Jyoti Basu who later became chief minister of Bengal, we do not know. But that said, it was a man-made famine. And of course, Nehru and others said later that this was deliberate. But in academic writing, there is nobody who had the courage to actually speak up and say that this was a deliberate policy of the British government. And this is because of the journey, which is exercised by Northern universities. You know, sorry, could you repeat that? And this is because of our, this is because of I missed the that. complete intellectual hegemony. Yes, dominance exercised by northern universities. We take our textbooks and model our textbooks on theirs. You know, we talk about world class education even to this day. The present government, and by that mean we mean the education of the ex colonial masters, which is highly biased, which has suppressed the reality of their colonial exploitation. I have spent 10 years of my life living in England, four years going to school in London, and the remaining six years, part of it in the University of Oxford, the rest in the University of Cambridge. And I have always been amazed at the extent of the bias in the understanding and teaching of economic history uh, in these elite institutions, even on the part of those who are considered to be progressive. So this is the sad situation. And then there is the fact that, you know, uh, people are bought off. For example, Keynes's favorite Indian student in Cambridge, obviously had a very good idea of what was going on in India. I won't take the name. Uh, okay. But, but <laughs> Kane's favorite Indian student, yes. Kane's favorite yeah. Indian student in Cambridge. But Kane's was instrumental in the setting up of the International Monetary Fund of um, after the war. At the Bretton Woods uh, Conference and later on at Savannah, the international conference which met to, as it were, regulate the international monetary order, 
set up the International Monetary Fund. And it was on Keynes's recommendation that his student, the Indian student, became one of the, the first Indian executive director in the International Monetary Fund. Now you do not expect Keynes's student to say that Keynes was responsible for the famine in Bengal, right? He should have said it if his objective was to project what is true. But most people in academic life, in any walk of life, do not put truth before expediency. They do not put truth before their own advancement. They think it expedient to keep quiet and they think what difference will it make? It will only make that I will not get a good job, I won't get a good income, but it will not undo the famine. It will not bring those 3 million back to life. So that's the kind of reasoning, you know, which has made people, even Indian intellectuals, actually suppress information. So speaking on the subject of Keynes, he's generally known as a progressive. So can you tell us a little bit more about generally his views, which would help us understand why did he fully understand the implications of his ec economic policies that he had recommended for India? And did he, um, and what, how was he personally affected when the, when such large number, he could have clearly seen that this ma massive catastrophe is, could be, it would be a uh, directly, directly resulting from his policies. So how was like, I just want to like, what, what, what were broadly his views on India in on Indians in general? You see, first of all, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, most people don't know that he had a association with India from the time he was 23 years old for 40 years until he died at the age of almost 63, all right? He died prematurely because he had heart disease, a chronic heart disease. He was only, he was, it was, he had not even had his 63rd birthday when he died in April 1946. But the point is that he actually uh, belonged to the English ruling class. He had a very, he came from a privileged background. It was not landed aristocracy, but it was a professional, as it were, elite, closely linked to the landed aristocracy. And he thought of, patriotism as serving the interests of his own country to the exclusion of any other consideration. Now, Keynes was probably the second most intelligent person, intellectual of the 20th century in the humanities. If you ask me who was the first most intelligent person, I would say a man called Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, otherwise known as Lenin. I would put him at number one and put Keynes at number two. Keynes read Lenin, Lenin read Keynes. Lenin of course was shot in the head and died from an assassin's bullet uh, in 1922. But he had read Keynes's economic consequences of the peace. They were on opposite sides. Lenin was a revolutionary. Keynes, you can think of Keynes as somebody who wanted to prevent revolution in his country. Now, people today do not understand how shaken the ruling classes were in all the advanced capitalist countries all over Europe by the Bolshevik revolutions. It terrified them. And for Keynes, the, he was intelligent enough to see that if the working class suffered unemployment because of the working of the capitalist system, because he recognized that the system that he served was not a planned system. It could not guarantee employment to workers and earnings to workers. There would be depression, and there was a deep depression during the 1930s, late 1920s to 1930s. Millions of people lost their jobs. So in such a situation, you know, Keynes put forward the argument, and essentially it was not that he was particularly pro-working class at all, but he saw rising unemployment as a political threat to the stability of the privileged order within which he had grown to manhood and which he wanted to preserve. He did not want that order to be disrupted and destroyed 
by any kind of uprising. So he put as his priority, the generation of employment through government intervention. And it was purely instrumental. You know, it was not that he was pro working class, but he wished to preserve the privileges of the ruling class in Britain. And he was intelligent enough to see that you had to do it by some form of intervention. You could not let the capitalist system just go into deep depression, which of course led to enormous working class anger and uh, uh, formation of the left wing uh, unions and so on. Okay. So this was his primary motivation. But that is why I mentioned that, however, his own biographer, Robert Skidelsky, who has written. Sorry, we missed that part. Some of you should. His, his biographer? Uh, Robert, yeah. uh, Robert Skidelsky from yeah. Cambridge has written a biography of Keynes in three volumes. Okay. And Skidelsky himself said that Keynes was not a believer in state intervention in the economy as a general principle. He did not believe in that. And that is born by the fact that he opposed rationing in Britain during wartime, all right? He was essentially a free marketeer. Only in one respect, he wanted intervention. And that is he wanted government, when there was deep depression, to spend in order to raise employment and incomes, spend judiciously, not spend a huge deficit, but a, a small deficit in the budget, because the dominant thing at that time was of completely balanced budgets, you know. And actually, when there was unemployment, people said, well, you have to tax people more, you have to reduce spending more. They were doing the opposite of what was required to uh, prevent unemployment from rising. So Keynes's theory was the opposite to the Treasury, the conservative view. He said, no, in order to, uh, uh, to counter the depression, the government needs to spend more. It can spend more than the resources it immediately has, because this through multiplier effects, spending more would through multiplier effects raise employment and incomes. And the requisite savings you need to finance the increased expenditure would be realized through that. So, you know, the conservative economists thought he was a raving revolutionary, far from the case. <laughs> you know, there so is a- Basically, the, the argument is the government needs to spend beyond its resources to um, uh, help the economy. Yeah, uh, there's an interesting title, uh, which is given in a book by the person who was, uh, for a time, the RBI governor, I forget his name now, which says, saving capitalism from the capitalists. So that was what Keynes was trying to do. He was trying to save the capitalist system from the stupidity of the capitalists, which led to enormous unemployment. But as far as the colonized population was concerned, you know, they didn't give two hoots whether people died or not. I will look at there, this, there, is, uh, you know, there is a question. Uh, in my paper, I quote, yeah. There's a question from Madhushri Mukherjee on this point. To what extent the British elites knowingly and deliberately rely on colonial spoils to fend off domestic communism? They used colonial sp uh, spoils not only, uh, I don't know whether the question relates to this specific period or to the period. Between... I think it's generally um, generally the case. I mean, because but also generally. I think now at this period, well, colonial well, communism would become argued, a big threat. So hmm. they, they would have tried different ways. You see, to what I have off. argued, what I have been arguing uh, in uh, my jointly authored book uh, with my husband, two books, A Theory of Imperialism and Capital and Imperialism, is that the extent of the colonial spoils Ex exceeds the, your wildest imagination, okay? The extent to which colonies like India were ripped off by the British has not been correctly calculated to date, and it was enormous. And it was not just to defend off communism, it was to industrialize the rest of the world. Because without the taking over India's export surplus earnings from the world, Britain could not possibly have exported capital, which it did to the European continent and to North America 
to build road, railroads, uh, to build roads, to invest in factories, all these capital exports would have been impossible if it had not completely appropriated its colonies export surplus earnings. That is the drain of wealth, okay? So it's much more than steering off communism. That is a part of it. It was really the industrialization of the Western world, which was crucially dependent on colonial exploitation. But they did very cleverly. Uh, since Britain was the home of classical political economy, the British did not go about doing their exploitation in the crude manner of King Leopold of Belgium, who in the Congo had the hands of the locals males cut off to terrorize the other males into providing free labor. Or they did not do it crudely like the Germans in Namibia, who actually set up death camps, which was a model for the later Nazi death camps in Germany. Uh, during the second war in which local tribes which opposed their exploitation were completely decimated. You know, they were killed in the death camp. They didn't do that. They did it through economic policy. And this economic policy really involves, to understand it involves a knowledge of uh, macroeconomics. It involves a knowledge of what was happening in Britain what was happening in the Western world, as well as what was happening in India. So it's quite a complex job. It is not an intellectual... Um, you, do you have more slides to go through? Yeah. Um, or um, I'm can... not able to change my slides to make it move up and down for some reason. <laughs> okay, then I don't know we, why. Maybe we just exit the screen so that we can see you then. You can turn on your video. It'll be better to have a conversation. I'll bring up some questions. Okay. okay. Then what do I do? Uh, stop share. Yeah, right. stop share. Awesome. Okay, okay. And now you turn on your video because All right. so that amazing. Great. Okay. Um, okay. So um, let me bring in okay. some other questions. There's another question from an attendee who's um, asking, does the British use of scorched earth policy in Bengal in fear of Japanese attack, um, can that be considered an important reason for the famine? Sorry, I, uh, I'm back to the screen now. I, I don't know how to get back to the... How do I get back to... The presentation? Uh, you want to show that uh, again? Maybe... Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I managed to get back. Yeah. Okay. So... Sorry, um, what was the question again? Yeah. So, the, do, you, do you think the British use of scorched earth policy, the denial policies in Bengal hmm. from fear of Japanese attack, do, do you think they, they contribute to, an, to be an important reason for the famine? Well, I know that Professor Amyo Bakshi has been putting this forward as a reason. And if you look at the uh, entry in Wikipedia on the Bengal famine, it's also cited there. No, I don't think it's an important reason. Because, uh, you know, the famine affected populations far in length. It affected populations in what is now Bangladesh, in the northern Bangladesh districts. And as I've told, uh, mentioned repeatedly, the scale of the devastation, the scale of the human mortality cannot be explained either by cyclone or by the fact that 8,000 boats were destroyed along coastal Orissa and Bengal because the British feared Japanese invasion. And uh, they also uh, got rid of food stocks uh, because this affected a very small area. It caused immense uh, distress to the fishermen whose boats were destroyed. It caused immense dis uh, distress to those particular villagers who were subjected to this policy, but it does not explain. It is again only uh, a small part of all the atrocities the British carried out, but it does not come anywhere near an explanation of the magnitude and scale of the famine. Okay, definitely not. And to focus on that, you can mention it, of course, it is a part of economic history, our economic history, but it is not the cause of this enormous mortality. It, so if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, I think one, one of the main questions I wanted to ask you was when you came out with this research and you published uh, this paper on um, 
Keynes involvement and this inf- deliberate inflationary policy how is how is the reception been from the academic world as well as the broader world well uh, the reception has been quite amazing because i did not expect so many people we did brought now i published my paper in economic and political weekly even though i was asked by some friends to publish it in uh, academic journals that they ran abroad radical uh, journals but i wanted this material to be available first and foremost to people in india because it is not known to students or to the educated public so that is why i published it in economic and political weekly and i did not expect it to be widely read now within a year of its publication it had it had been circulated all over the arab world it had been circulated in uh you know departments uh, not economics departments of course but uh, departments um, uh, of culture studies and literature and so on in many uh, universities in the us in canada in uk and you know i i was really taken aback because i was not aware that there was a groundswell of uh, opinion now in western universities not in the economics departments they are the most conservative uh, and they are the pits actually you know because they will simply ignore they have always ignored and they will continue to ignore the whole question of colonial exploitation of imperialism and so on they take their uh, line completely from the most conservative departments uh, in universities uh, in the what are they called the ivy league universities in the us Uh, in britain and so on right but there are these departments other departments where people are engaged in uh, what are called decolonization studies okay where they are beginning to unravel the t- true history of the colonies and there are a number of people in these departments who have migrated there from ex colonized countries themselves so yes the reception has been unusually good of course i expect stream economists to ignore it completely which they have but if any of them engages with me then i can take because their beliefs and their arguments are based on nothing but bias and lack of research whereas i think i have done sufficient research over the last 30 years because my first paper on the bengal famine which identified it as a profit inflation was published in 1991 that's more than 30 years ago now in the journal of peasant studies uh it was called food availability and famine a longer view and it was a critique of professor amrita sen's uh, uh writing on the bengal famine not just on the bengal famine on famine in general in which i was arguing that he was looking at too short a period and that if you look at a longer period in every colonized country there was food availability declined in india for example if you look at george blins study food availability per capita declined from an average of 200 kilos mentioned just after the first world war to this abysmally low level of 137 kilograms and i show in my book the republic of hunger where i look at the situation of japan and japan's exploitation of korea of uh, the netherlands exploitation of java that you find exactly the same phenomenon because all these metropolitan countries wanted tropical commodities that they could not produce themselves so they wanted a change in the cropping pattern and they did not invest so the cropping pattern in colonized countries changed away from food production for their own populations towards export crops and this led to a fall in per capita production and availability so my critique of professor sen in my original 1999 article was that he's right when he says that there was a huge inflation in bengal but he's wrong when he says that food availability decline is not important because it takes a very short period of only 3 or 4 years if you look at the longer period of 50 years there was enormous food availability decline 
and the population of Bengal was particularly vulnerable to famine, which resulted from Britain's you know, pol wartime policy because Bengal experienced an almost 40% decline of its per capita food availability. Whereas the average for the whole of British India was around 20%, 19% to be precise. In Bengal, it was 38%. That is almost double that. It was exactly double that. So the population of Bengal had already experienced a huge decline in its nutritional standard by the time we get to the Second World War. Its population was already weakened. And yet this was the, uh, this was the theater for the maximum extraction of resources, because this is where the allied troops were concentrated. This is where most of the procurement took place. This is where the maximum price rise took place. Rest of India, prices rose two to three times. In Bengal, they rose six, seven, even eightfold. You know? So that is the difference between acute hunger and people somehow surviving in the rest of India and mass starvation in Bengal. That is what made really the difference. And this was not the first famine in Bengal under the British. They, this was uh, the nth famine. There were so many famines during the colonial rule in Bengal, but also in other parts of the country. But if we were to you understand this from a lens of Keynesian policies, then do you think the previous famines were an outcome of just general food shortage or natural events? Or was it that Bengal had become so vulnerable under the colonial oppression that any kind, any trigger would push it into a famine state? No, you see things, uh, uh, natural uh, occasions like drought, periodic drought is bound to happen in agriculture. I mean, even in post-independence India, we have had droughts. But the question is, how do people survive droughts? I mean, farmers, peasants are not foolish. They knew, they know that if there's a run of good harvest years, maybe there'll be a drought. You know, if uh, they have had a run of four, five, six good harvest years, they anticipate that maybe the next year won't be so bad, it's so good. So they prepare for drought by laying aside stocks. But what colonial policy did was to prevent them from laying aside stocks because colonial policy did two things. One is that it changed the cropping patterns, so the food availability and production itself on a per head basis declined because they wanted the export crops they could not produce themselves. Okay, That is one major reason why they colonized us in the first place, because cold temperate lands cannot produce tropical crops. And they cannot even produce what they can produce in summer in their winter months. Okay. So this kind of uh, you know, uh, pressure on us to specialize, to fill supermarket shelves continues to this day. So that is one thing, the decline in food grains production and availability, which goes back to the early colonial period, but we don't have systematic data. We have systematic data for the whole of India, only from 1881 onwards, which is when the census and collection of economic data started. But there's no doubt it started long before that, for a century or long or more before that, okay? And the second feature, which led to endemic famine in colonized India, and of course, Bengal was the area region which was colonized first. It underwent the longest period of colonization. So endemic uh, uh, famines, the second reason which led to it is that the producers of export crops were not actually paid. They were paid out of taxes which were contributed by all producers in the form of direct tax, that is land revenue, and indirect taxes like the fact that they had to pay for salt seven to eight times. Salt was a government monopoly. Its price was seven to eight times what it would have been without government monopoly. And additionally, there was the opium monopoly and there were other indirect. So both through land revenue, direct taxes, and when the peasant was a tenant of a landlord, he had to pay rent to the landlord, the landlord in turn paid tax to the state. So this taxation revenues that the uh, colonial government extracted, it spent in a very abnormal manner, which you do not find in any independent country. And this is again something which is uh, the basis of the drain of wealth. That is up to a third or even more of the taxation revenues were not spent within the country at all. They were paid out to the peasants and 
practices against the goods that the company bought and later on the goods that were exported by them directly abroad, which earned foreign exchange. That foreign exchange went into the British Treasury through the financial mechanism of the council bill. I would need another hour to explain to you yes. what the council bill mechanism was, okay, <laughs> which we don't have. But the whole of the foreign exchange earnings went to the, into the British Treasury and the farmers and artisans were paid out of their own taxes, which means they were not paid. So it was a very clever economic mechanism. Uh, you know, they got the goods free. The goods were tax financed. They were the product equivalent of taxes. Now, this meant that the British were operating surplus budgets, which in Keynesian terms means that if you operate surplus budgets, if you collect 100 rupees of taxes and you're only spending 60 rupees or 70 rupees within the country, the other 30 you're appropriating as uh, in the form of goods, okay, which is being exported not only to your country, but all over the world and the foreign exchange you're taking. That surplus budget, operation of surplus budgets is going to lower through the negative operation of the Keynesian multiplier. It is going to lower incomes and employment in the exploited country. And that is why the per capita income in British India, India had the second largest export surplus earnings in the entire world, second only after the United States. For at least three decades for which we have data from uh, the 1890s right up to 1929, that's four decades actually, not three decades, the second largest earnings. And it probably had the second largest earnings from the mid 19th century. We have uh, S.B. Saul's book, Studies in British Overseas Trade, which establishes this. And I myself have analyzed United Nations data, very detailed country-wise data, you know, which shows that we had enormous export surplus earnings, but we were not allowed to keep a single penny. All of it went into the British Exchequer through a very clever financial mechanism, which was so clever. And of course, the British uh, who administered this, you know, the Secretary of State and others kept the mechanism hidden. They didn't talk about it. Was, was there a way for us to claim those reserves even after independence? So if, there, if, if the if Bank of England or British Treasury was ho was basically holding these council bills against which they were issue, issue printing rupees in India, was there a way eventually for India to claim those foreign treasury, for, foreign currency reserves that were being held on India's behalf? Well, if India did claim, then the British economy would collapse. You know, it would not have the resources. It would not have the resources to pay even a fraction of what they took because the British economy um, was very small. So they absorbed only a part of it within their economy, but the rest of it they exported to develop the areas of uh, recent settlement where their own immigrants had gone and settled. Right. Like 40% of immigration in the 19th century uh, was from Britain to the Americas. Later on, the other countries in Europe increased their out-migration. You know, so they built the roads and the other things where their own population had migrated, the areas of white settlement. You know? Britain itself was too small to absorb the huge amounts that it absorbed, uh, that it took from India and other call. India was the biggest, but it was also exploiting the Caribbean. It was exploiting Kenya, Tanzania, you know, a whole host of other smaller countries as well. I'd just like to go back to the topic of Bengal farm. And there's one more question that I want yeah. to take on there. So there's a question from Anibesh Singh. Um, Japan occupation of Burma in 1942, and which led to the uh, seizing of the rice imports. And thus the, there was a supply side disruption. Was it one of the causes of the famine? I think this has been already uh, studied by many scholars. And they found these... Um, they found it to be quite moderate, the shortfall because of the cessation. You know, if you have a shortfall, you can always import. Okay. Uh, Sub-Saharan African countries now import 40% of their grain consumption. They don't produce enough themselves. So you can prevent famine by importing. And India had the foreign exchange. It was earning foreign exchange. So there was no the autonomy to do such a thing, right? To, Sorry? India, India in, the government of Bengal had no autonomy 
to import, to use foreign reserves, to import rice or grain from anywhere else? There was no government of Bengal. There was the colonial government. And um, uh, in fact, uh, it was exporting, not importing. Yes, okay. it was exporting to Sri Lanka. And uh, when the famine uh, was raging, the Secretary of State for India at that time was Leopold Emery. And he wrote uh, an urgent, uh, uh, he sent an urgent message to Churchill saying that in view of the famine, we should stop exporting rice. So Churchill uh, responded, and I'm sure your other participants like Manjushri Mukherjee would be far better equipped to answer this question. He refused. He said that if the famine was as bad as you make out, uh, Gandhi should be dead by now. You know, but Gandhi is alive, so the famine can't be that bad. And earlier, Churchill had said that the Hindus are a foul uh, race. Uh, they're a beastly people, and they're only prevented from meeting the doom that is their due by their own pollution. Now, pollution is the term you use for insects when they swarm, when they multiply, you know. It's a term you use for the animal kingdom, not for the human kingdom. So this whole business of Indians was swarming. They were reproducing themselves like rabbits. This pejorative terminology is what is not uh, the kind of terminology a, a statesman uh, should be using. But Churchill himself was really, in his personal views, a fascist. Uh, he was also you know, very interested in eugenics, as I point out in my paper. He was very interested in reducing what he called the uh, number of feeble-minded persons uh, in Britain. By feeble-minded, he meant people who were mentally handicapped. By the way, my younger son has Down syndrome. So my husband and I were just discussing that Churchill would have wanted him killed, you know, and not live. Because these people thought they were gods. They thought that they could determine even the genetic composition of their population. That is what eugenics is about. So let us have no illusions that uh, you know India could have imported. It had the foreign exchange, even during the war. In fact, in my paper, I have given you figures of how much foreign exchange it was earning, even during the period of the war. But all of this foreign exchange was appropriated by Britain, saying it was owed by India to Britain. And not a single penny was released for food import. So the, you know, the sheer, as it were, ruthlessness of this policy is something people have to understand. They have to understand that deaths of colonized people meant nothing to the rulers. All they were interested in is their own economic, the economic self-interest of their own populations. That is all. And even those who were progressive, who were honorable, and uh, who would have, would have been shocked if they had known at that time what was happening. They were powerless to do anything because the reins of government were controlled basically by the people who couldn't care less. And they couldn't care less by the Second World War because they also knew they were getting out of India, that they could not sustain their control over India. Earlier, they were concerned that the famines should not be so severe that output is affected. Because if you allow a large fraction of your population to die, working population, to die of starvation, that will affect output. Output will fall. That is what had happened in the 19, uh, in the 1770 Great Famine in Bengal. That was only five years after the East India Company acquired the right of revenue connection. Right. It was a trading company. It had no experience of governance. It was they went mad with avarice, and they increased the revenue collection threefold in just five years. All right. In the Cambridge Economic History of India, you will find no mention of the 1770 famine, which according to the East India Company officials, killed 10 million people, one third of the population of Bengal. Probably the largest recorded famine in history. But I our think... own economists, our own economic historians make no mention of it. Yeah. So, completely... so their, their, their rule over India started with a major famine that... Yeah killed a third of Bengal's population and it ended with That's another right. horrible another horrifying another huge 
horrifying famine. So, exactly, exactly. And and I think but that's the sad. The, sad and, thing and I think that's, that's the is, that's there. There could be no more clear verdict. on their rule over india and still it puzzles me not only the the british academicians and scholars and people but also a lot of indian apologists self appointed apologists for the colonial rule keep trying to deny this and keep trying to come up with fallacious arguments on why colonial rule was good and somehow it gave us the right you know to- you know one thing that we must bear in mind when our book was published there was a interesting comment made by a reviewer who said that Uh, one is tired of always being the victim so i said in a talk who was the victim my my forebears were not victims the lady who reviewed her ancestors were not victims because they belonged to the property classes the property classes did very well under british rule reasonably right. well because the british did not rule india by themselves a few in, thousand british could not rule india by themselves there's in collusion with the indian elites the local elites Yeah. which they did the zamindars of bengal stood solidly behind british rule even when the rest of india was erupting in rebellion in 1857 they supported british rule why because they were doing well out of it the trading classes the money lenders and traders were doing well why because there was such a shortage of money with the peasantry and with small producers since they were not being paid their full dues the rates of interest that people could charge was 15% 20% even more okay they were doing well so make no mistake our internal class structure has been a highly equal unequal one and the british took advantage of that and after independence things changed a bit there was an attempt to reduce inequalities but now again it is a highly unequal structure and the british educational policy that macaulay started was to has been hugely successful in bengal itself it produced a class of professionals you know doctors lawyers mainly do- lawyers actually to begin with uh, teachers and so on and they were grateful to british rule they are the people who are carrying forward fallacious theories you know we have with the british and the foreign universities do not need, need to send their professors or their textbooks here we have enough apologists for colonial rule amongst our own intellectuals because they have been trained and i would say completely brainwashed by being told from practically from birth i am a bengali myself married to an odia but i am from bengal practically from with your mother's milk they are told that if you want to succeed then you have to as an academic you have to get a certificate from abroad you have to get a phd from a foreign university preferably the best known ones you have to get some kind of certificate from well known uh, professors abroad otherwise your work will not be considered good so this entire hierarchical system uh, of appreciation which has been built up you know has completely undermined the independence of our intellectuals so it takes an effort It takes a very big effort to get out of this mindset. All of the direct rule has gone. The the intellectual. Sorry? I'm saying all of the direct rule has gone. The intellectual exactly. hegemony continues. The cultural the hegemony. The colonized the colonized mind continues, and it's uh, it needs a real understanding and an effort to abandon the colonized mind. I mean, I was completely. I mean, very. Uh, I had an inferiority complex when I was a student. and i went to oxford or cambridge i thought i mean these are great men for producing great work it was only slowly i realized that the work they were producing was highly biased it was very incomplete it was factually inaccurate when i started doing some basic research myself so it has taken me all of 50 years to overcome uh, this colonization i think i haven't fully overcome it but to a large extent i think i have overcome it and it's a very uphill struggle you know because even today Uh, i i used to provoke my students by saying that if if a, a professor from a harvard or princeton now this is not oxford and cambridge anymore like in my time it's kind of princeton or harvard or whatever you know stanford uh, stands on a podium before you and says the sun does not rise in the east it rises in the west there would be some student who would say ah that's a very interesting proposition sir some economic student i will mathematize your proposition and i will develop a lemma and i will publish it in 
a foreign journal, you know. So that is the sad situation. And my students were very provoked. They said, no, 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 we are not like that. You know, we would not never say that. We would question That's hilarious. the professor there have been said actually, the sun rises in the West. There have been actually studies in the US that just in terms, when somebody makes a statement like that and you're supposed to say that whether or not you would, like how likely you are to believe it or dis, or reject it, can actually, so it depends on subjective factors, like the accent of the person who's saying it, the voice and the accent. You're, I, 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 there's studies which show that a man's voice, people find it more reliable than a woman's voice. Yes. Certain accents like the British accent, people are more likely to attach more credibility to it than uh, other accents. Uh, so yeah. it's actually- That's very it, interesting. That's very yeah, interesting. and the, there have been studies in terms of how subjective uh, uh, our minds still uh, are on, exactly. on these matters, even on even on highly objective statements. But yes. look, I think I'm very, uh, the, the, the effort of uh, scholars like you are actually what's going to ultimately help us decolonize our minds. So uh, as an so. Indian, I'm very, <laughs> I'm really appreciative of the um, of the work you've been doing, and I and and I wish you all the best to continue with this kind of great, great work, and uh, and I th thank you once again for uh, joining us. Uh, it was this was this has been an absolute honor to have you with us. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it, and I'm uh, sorry it, it was not smooth. You know, the, it kept breaking up and so on. But anyway. No problem. Next, next time we'll uh, we'll we'll do another interesting topic, perhaps to explore the topic of the the wealth drain, and we'll uh, yeah. 